good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to, uh, to Philip Pike from uh, GT Vision, who's going to be talking to us tonight, uh, uh, giving us an introduction to digital microscopy. I know this is a, a subject that's of great interest to many people, so I do hope we're going to in, enjoy it. We haven't got very many people this evening, but I'm sure they're going to make up with that with lots of questions for you, Phil. And I know <laughs> that you're really good at answering questions because I have emailed you so many questions over the past year. But don't worry, I haven't run out of questions. If nobody else has got them, I'll keep you on your toes. That's but fine. Anyway, without any further ado, I'd like to hand the, uh, the session over to you, Phil. And I am really looking forward uh, to hearing what you have to tell us this evening. Okay. Thank well, thanks very much, Paul. Um, just wanted to give an introduction really to digital microscopy, which involves basically capturing images of your samples. Um, I sort of deal with some of the common questions we get asked at GT Vision. Um, and I can't in the talk cover all the options, but just to give an overview to it, obviously if people have questions, just please ask us. So first thing is types of microscope head. So we have a binocular head, standard microscope, eyepieces, binocular head, and a trinocular headed microscope. This one has a photo port on top. And obviously attaching cameras to these two uh, are, are quite different. So if we think about adding a camera onto a trinocular head to start with, so you might think, oh, this is easy peasy, buy the camera, lop it on and off you go. It's not quite as straightforward as that, as that though. A um, couple of things to take into account. First of all, what camera do I buy? I'm going to come on to that in a bit, a bit later. But another criteria is what choice of C-mount adapter? So the C-mount adapter is the adapter that goes between the trinocular port of the microscope and the camera. So with microscope cameras, it's a set size, an inch diameter and a particular um, thread pitch. And this is the sort of range of C-mount adapters that we do, or part of the range. So you see there's a huge range of them. You need to be quite careful to choose the appropriate one for your microscope and your camera. So how do you decide? Well, first of all, it's microscope specific, the C-mount adapter. So there'll be a C-mount adapter for each brand of microscope and often each type of microscope. So for instance, Leica will have a C-mount adapter maybe for their upright microscopes and the different one for their inverted microscopes and the different one for their stereo microscopes. And also the magnification. So you have quite a broad range of magnifications, 0.3 times up to two times. So why is this important? Well, what it enables you to do is you need to look at the size of the camera sensor. And that's generally stated in fractions of an inch typically. And what you need to do is choose a magnification that matches the camera field of view to the eyepiece field of view. And so what that means is when you're looking down the eyepieces of the microscope and then you look at the camera display, you want to see vaguely the right, the same field of view with both of them. You can, if you wanted to do, maybe use a higher magnification one to get a bigger magnification, but generally with these type of things, eyepieces matching the camera display, it's quite a nice way of doing it. So how do you actually decide? Well, here's something from our website showing some of our cameras. And you see here, for example, that the U3 Pro 20 has a one inch sensor, and the U3 Pro 6.3 has a around about a half inch sensor. And there's a table here, which you can look at, which says, so for a half inch sensor, like the U3 Pro 6.3, you need to use around about a half time C-mount. And then for a one inch sensor camera, like the U3 Pro 20, you need to use a sort of 0.75 or one time C-mount adapter. And so using these, you can actually say, you know, here's the camera I've got, here's the C-mount adapter I need, and it matches up quite nicely. In terms of the camera choice, there's four parameters really to consider. First one is the sensitivity of the camera. And what does that mean? Well, it's basically how much of the light is converting into a signal in the camera. That's how many photons are converted into electrons. It's used expressed in things like millivolts or volts per lux second. And generally, the more of this, the better. So a camera with more millivolts as a sensitivity will be better than one with less. 
resolution. This is usually, this is a measure of the pixel size of the camera and it's generally measured in microns. Again, if you want a camera with high resolution, smaller pixels will be better than one with larger pixels. The dynamic range of the camera. The dynamic, the dynamic range is the range of light intensities between the darkest and lightest parts of the image. It's generally expressed in decibels or bits. So a 12-bit camera would have 4,096 levels of dynamic range. And the final component is the frame rate. So this is usually expressed in frames per second. It's how fast the images are recorded. This is generally only really needed for video recording. Um, for just taking single images, it's not really an issue. But if you're capturing something dynamic, you may need to say, OK, I might need a camera with a faster frame rate, for example. So when you're looking at camera specifications, these are sort of four criteria you really pro would probably want to be looking at. Ah, I hear you ask. But what about the sensor size in megapixels? Well, with a microscope camera, that's not really an issue, and I can explain why. So here's something from the Nikon Microscopy U website. So what we have here, and basically this enables you to actually see what camera size would be needed for a particular magnification. So for example, here we have a half inch format camera with the correct video couplet 0.5 times. We have an objective magnification of four times. And then what the website shows is the optimum array size is about 2.7 megapixels. So you, for a four times magnification image, you don't need a very large camera. What about high magnification, say 10 times? So here, here we have a 10 times image, and this time it gives you a pretty much a four megapixel camera needed. And if you go even higher magnification, 40 times, you only need 1.7 megapixels. So if you actually look at this, and it's, it's a really useful resource, it is on the Nikon Microscopy website. It actually sort of shows that you, you really need, you don't really need, ever need more than about a sort of five megapixel camera. So I know first thing people using DLSRs, they always think, oh yeah, more megapixels, the better. But for most microscopes, you're looking at really quite a tiny field of view. So you don't need a huge megapixel camera. What are the sort of general types of microscope camera? Well, the basic one is this one, which is a basically a USB camera. So what does this do? So it has a USB connection here. This is the C mount that connects to the microscope. And so the USB camera connects to a USB to a PC or a Mac, and that runs some camera control software. Another type of camera might be this one, which is a HDMI camera. So basically this only connects to a display screen via HDMI, using your HDMI port here, and you can save images onto an SD card if you need to save images. It, will, it won't connect to a PC, but there's built-in software in the camera you can access via the menu buttons here. You can do things like to optimize the image and so on. Third type of camera is a combined one of those two, so it does USB and HDMI. So basically this one connects to a PC, but also has a built-in display screen, as you can see here. So you can actually capture stuff, images onto the PC, as well as see them on the display screen on top of the microscope. So this is really handy if you're doing any sort of project work or display work, where you may want to show an image to a number of people, and you can actually get them to say, you don't have, they, they don't need to look down the eyepieces of the microscope, they can just see the display screen on the camera, and there you go. You can also connect, if you wanted to, to a large HDMI screen, like a sort of PC screen or something like this. You want to do a sort of really big presentation or like to a PC projector or something. So these are really nice cameras and really very versatile for people who want to do any sort of presentations type things. So the fourth type would be this one, which is a Wi-Fi camera. But basically, same principle, but this time it connects to a PC, tablet, or smartphone via Wi-Fi. Wi -Fi. And with this one, you can download apps for image analysis onto your phone, do some little bit, you know, tweaking of the image, save it onto your phone, then you can email it or anything like this that you might want to. So if you've got a binocular microscope, how can you attach a camera to that? 
well, you don't have a trinocular port, but there are still ways of, of attaching a camera to a binocular microscope. Basically, there are two options here. The first one is using some sort of eyepiece camera. So this is a, again a camera with an eyepiece socket. So, that, so you take your eyepiece out of your microscope, plug the eyepiece camera in, the camera then connects to a PC via the USB, and you can capture images that way. The other option is by using a, an eyepiece tube adapter for a C-mount camera. So the cameras we were talking about earlier, you basically attach the C-mount adapter, plug it into the eyepiece of the microscope, and again, off you go. Um, obviously, this is a little bit, little bit more versatile because you have a better choice of cameras and things like that. Um, and then there's a range of magnifications, again, to suit the particular size of the camera sensor. So if you've got a binocular microscope, it's not a problem. You can still attach a camera to it by one of these two methods. What about other cameras? Things like DSLRs. Can you connect that to a microscope? Well, yep. Um, there are adapters for this. So here have a DSLR adapter, T-mount. Um, a few things about this though, you really need good quality adapters to get a good image and they can be expensive. Um, when you actually set it up like this, the camera won't autofocus auto reliably and it can be difficult to see the image on the small LCD screen on the back of the camera. So it can be difficult to see whether the actual image is in focus or not. Unless it's a DLSR, DSLR, you may need to lock the mirror up uh, when it takes an image. But having said that, you can actually get some excellent images with these. It just needs a little bit more effort in terms of getting the right adapter and everything sorted out for you. And how about your smartphone? Again, there's adapters for these, so you can actually capture um, images via a smartphone. This is one type of one that we supply. And again, the parameters are eclipse onto the microscope like, so eyepiece, camera looks down the eyepiece to capture the image. Ideally, it should have some way of actually centering the camera over the eyepiece of the microscope, so you're actually getting a really nice image. I have to say, there are some cheap ones around which don't really hold the phone very securely, so you should not want to have it sat up when the phone falls off. So again, it's worthwhile, again, you know, looking for something of reasonable quality, so, so, so it holds us the, the, your phone securely and in the right orientation. Digital microscopes. Now, there are some dedicated digital microscopes, and there's a couple of main types. I mean, one is this thing called a dino light. So a dino light looks like this. It might look a bit like a toy, but it's not. It's actually a really, really high quality microscope. Um, what it is, it's a combined microscope illumination camera. So around this part of the microscope, there's eight LEDs which illuminate your sample for you. And then you can focus and zoom in using the wheel here. So connect to a PC or whatever by USB again, running the software. The good thing about this is it's fully portable. So you can have it connected to a tablet, you can take it into the field, do some you know, microscopy work on things you find when you're doing some sort of field work or something like that. Um, it doesn't need a power supply, so it, can use, it just runs off the battery or on the tablet. They're just really handy from that point of view. Now there's a huge range of these. I mean, most might be five, seven, seven, 10 times to 70 times, some up to 200 times. Some have built in polarizers to reduce reflections. Some have UV illuminators. And there's a range of stands available. So you can, again, it helps you optimize the orientation of the dino light to your sample. But again, sort of one, one sort of word of warning, there are some cheap low quality clones and you need to be sort of quite careful about these because you know, they aren't as good quality as a dino light. The dino light is basically, you know, the sort of the leading part of this sort of mi microscope. Um, so you need to be a bit cautious about this. A dino light here in the UK costs from about 80 pounds up to 800 pounds. So you can get some really nice ones for a sort of reasonable amount. But if you want a sort of really good quality one, you know, you, you can get those as well. Another type of digital microscope is basically a dedicated digital microscope, which look, looks like this. So with this one, it's a standard microscope body. As you can see here, you have the microscope stage, illumination, objectives, but no eyepieces. So with this one, you just view the sample onto the screen. So the good thing about this is the image goes straight to the camera sensor. So there's no beam splitters. Normally with the microscope, you've got a beam splitter to allow the light to go either to the eyepieces or to the camera, or it splits the beam so it 
it can go to both. With this, you get all the light going straight forward onto the camera sensor. So it gives you a very high quality image. And then once you're looking at the image, you can actually save it onto the microscope, USB stick or onto a PC, depending on the options as to how the uh, digital microscope works. One sort of maybe a little bit of a downside with these though is that it's all one unit and you can't upgrade it. So with a microscope and camera, if you thought, oh, I want to buy a new camera, you just buy a new camera, it goes on your microscope. With this, it's all one unit. So if you ever wanted to something better, you'd have to replace the whole unit. So let's look at some camera software just to show you just a few features of it. Um, so one of the things you'd want to do obviously is set the exposure. So this is our one of our microscope softwares and you can see on the menu bar over here you can set it for an auto exposure you can you can use the see here the green square which is taking the auto exposure target from and then it sort of allows it to actually optimize the image as far as it thinks if you don't want to auto expose you can just turn that off you can set the exposure time and the game independently you can also do things like change the resolution of the image up here so if you wanted a faster frame rate you can actually reduce the reduce the uh, resolution of the image and so on. And as, as you can see here, the, the, the actual software, which you get with, with our cameras, you get it free with the camera. You've got a huge range of options to choose from to actually allow you to optimize and play with the images to how you see fit. What you can do actually, having got the image, you can then optimize it in some way. So you can use the histogram here to actually sort of, uh, again, it makes the image a little bit more punchy, um, gives you a little bit more contrast. One way, as I said, you can use this RGB image histogram here. You've also got color adjustments. You can change things like the brightness and contrast and gamma. So having got the image displayed on your screen, there's a number of ways of actually optimizing it to make it look really nice and precise for you. Third one is measurements. So with this one, it enables you to take your image. You can do things like add annotations to it. So this is a cucurbit spit stem. You can put arrows on to identify bits of the image, put dermal tissue, and then you can do measurements with it. So you can draw a line which says, okay, this is 0.1 of a millimeter, or you can have a circle, which again gives you a 0.1 millimeter diameter. But then you've got a range of other things up here. You can have like, you know, rectangles, ellipses, concentric, concentric circles, uh, right angles, arcs, and things like this as well. So you've actually got a huge range of measurements you can do with these images. I mean, most people just want to draw a line and say, you know, how long is that? But again, if you do need to measure something like a circular image and so you know, it works out, you know, what's the diameter radius perimeter and area of it, it will do all, all of that for you as well. One interesting feature of camera software is this thing called extended depth of field, which I think may be relevant to people doing entomology. Um, extended depth of field, sometimes either called extended depth of focus or focus stacking. What it's useful for is where you have a sample where the sample depth is large. So that's the depth from the top to the bottom of the image. And it's where you can't get the whole sample in focus. And what you do is you just take a number of images at different focal planes and get the software to combine it all into one image for you. So I've got some images here. Sorry, they're not really very interesting images. It's actually for a customer sample. And what they did was they actually 3D printed a little sort of plastic tower. So let me show you. Um, so basically, so this here's an image. So the base of this is in focus, as you, as you can see, but the top part of the tower isn't. So you can change the focal plane, and you can see then the top is in focus, but the base isn't. So what you can do is, as I said, you can take a stack of seven images and actually get the software to combine them. And this is a stack of seven images, and you see the base and the top of the tower are both in focus, as are that you can see the sides as well. So it's actually a really useful thing to do. Um, if you have, you know, something where, you know, you've got some top bit and the bottom bit isn't in focus. So it's very straightforward and easy to do. A couple of things about us as a company, GT Vision. So basically, we're probably the UK's leading independent, in, independent microscope supplier. So what does that mean? So essentially, we sell microscopes from Leica, Olympus and Nikon. Um, so three of the big four microscope suppliers. So we can advise about which microscope might be suitable for you. We also sell Meiji, Motix and Neuromex. Again, slightly less well-known brands, but still excellent in their areas. 
And we have our own brand of microscopes called GX microscopes, you know, good quality, very nicely priced microscopes. So from our point of view, we can say, you know, if you want a top of the range Leica, Olympus or Nikon, we can do that. If you want something, you know, more cost effective, we can do that as well. So huge range to choose from. And not only microscopes, we can supply cameras, obviously. Then illuminators like ring lights, spotlights, and something we want to talk about a bit more detail, a dome light. So what's a dome light? Well, it's this thing here. Um, what it does do is so it attaches to a stereo microscope and the LEDs shine upwards into the white, into a, the white dome. So that then reflects the light downwards. And so you, you get very few reflections from this. So if you're using something like a ring light, you can often see the spots of the ring light in your image. With this one, you don't really get any reflections at all. It produces very nice overall balanced type of light. Um, so it fits onto most stereo microscopes, 60 millimeter diameter objectives. And it's really excellent for taking photos. Again, it gives you really, really nice, even illumination for taking photos. Slight downside of it, it is expensive. It's 400, 535 pounds. But you know, if people want you know, really, really top quality illuminator, it's worthwhile considering. What else about GT Vision? Well, we have a range of microscope stands, track stands, boom on articulated arms. If you want something to actually orientate your microscope in a particular way, you've got an articulated arm stand for that. You've got parts, as you see here, do magnifiers. And also we can service virtually any microscope. So what this means is we can, one of our engineers will come along, clean it, inspect it, adjust it, align it and test it. For any information about GT Vision, obviously the best place to look is our website, gtvision.co.uk. That's just a screenshot of it. So you want to look at some information. So we have some buttons down here you can click on. If you want to look at stereo microscopes, biological microscopes. Maybe you want to look at, see what our range of Leica microscopes is, cameras, a range of options down here. If you need help, we've got a button there. Just click there, you can put in a message to us. Sales at gtvision.co.uk for any inquiries or our phone number. So. Hopefully you found that helpful and interesting. Um, happy to answer any questions that you have. But I said, you know, for any information that you may want to just have a browse around, there's our website, you know, please go to that at any station, have a look. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. That was uh, really interesting. I thought I knew quite a lot about microscopes and honestly in that half hour, I learned an awful, awful lot. Um, some great ways to spend money as well. Um, I, I yeah. love that, that I mean, dome it's... light. I, I, have, uh, I, uh, I have a think about that because I have to say, you know, I do so much photography down the microscope. And I, if somebody said, what's the most important thing? I would say lighting, lighting and lighting. Yeah. And for stack focus photography, you need to make every individual photograph as best as you possibly can. Oh, yes. It means it comes down to lighting, lighting and lighting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. For stacking, you need to have sort of the same illumination in each part of the stack. Otherwise, you get some, you know, quite strange aberrations with it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, as you say, I mean, you know, yes, the illumination is the key thing. You know, and the, and the good thing about most stereo microscopes is you have, you can have a range of, I said, you know, ring lights, dome lights, spotlights, hmm. um, and different ways of actually illuminating the image um, to actually, you know, make sure you actually got the, the images, you know, exactly, you know, set up the way you want it. So, yeah. Hmm. 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 Uh, has any, anybody else? I mean, I, I could keep asking questions. Can I raise that? Uh, so, so, Philip, I, 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 this is a difficult question, but I, I feel people will be wanting to know at this point for, for the different you know, the, the, the basic different categories of microscope that you went through in your talk. Could you just give us some idea of typical prices? Uh, obviously at the present time, we, you know, over, over time this might change, but pe people are gonna wanna know, you know, uh, is, he, is he talking about a 200 pound microscope or a 20,000 pound microscope? Just um, give us a ballpark, some ballpark idea. Well, okay, I can. So with the microscopes, you you want to talk about just what stereo microscopes, biological microscopes, or the cameras? Yeah. Or what? Well, mo let, let's let's talk about stereo microscopes because most mostly that's what I think most people we we don't tend to use in this group. We don't tend to use um, uh, very high magnifications. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I switch backwards and forwards between a compound microscope and a stereo microscope. 
uh, but I probably spend 95% of my time on the stereo microscope. So let's, mm. let's, let's stick it to that. Okay. Um, I mean, you could probably get a good quality basic stereo microscope on a dual illuminated track stand for sort of three to 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that would be a zoom stereo microscope with a zoom range maybe from sort of seven times up to sort of 45 or 50 times. Um, so, you know, the idea with this one, you can sort of zoom out and actually see, you know, a nice overall, you know, your sample can zoom in to see the you know, little hairs on, the, on its back leg or something like that. Um, and that would be the sort of the main type that we would probably, you know, would start to discuss with people. Um, as I said, we have a range of stands. So if you wanted it on a some sort of boom arm stand, if you look, I mean, I know from entomology it's not really an issue, but we get people who we often sort of who are doing sort of archaeological archaeological stuff or paleontology, whether you want to sort of you know extract something from a big piece of rock, or they want to be able to orientate the microscope head of yeah, no, we're, we're, we're we're relatively in charge of our specimens. They do, yeah, they do exactly, what we but, tell them to do. <laughs> exactly, but I'm saying you know there are a range of stands that are available with this as well. Um, I mean, so I said basic one, sort of three to 100 pounds. But I think the thing with microscopes is that, um, you know, as the price increases, so does the optical quality. Mm -hmm. So say for sort of seven, 800 pounds, you get something that's optically nicer. Mm -hmm. um, again, so we have, so the one, initial one I'm talking about is called our, our Ultra Zoom 1. We have said it's sort of three to 400 pounds. We have an ultra zoom three, which is sort of seven, eight hundred pounds type of thing, which again, you know, has a bigger objective, collects more light, is better optically, sort of thing. Um, these, these these prices are for the microscope, so the camera adapters uh, would need to be added to that. So the camera adapters would probably be about fifty pounds, so that's not a huge cost. Mm -hmm. um, and then go back to stereos, and then you know, then if you wanted something like a you know a reasonably nice Leica microscope, you're looking at maybe sort of two to three thousand pounds. If you want a very nice Leica microscope, you're looking at 10 to 12,000 pounds. Mm. So again, it's one of those things, you know, how much you want to spend on it. Um, and the, and the, the cameras, the digital cameras? So again, we have, I mean, our best value camera is a five megapixel camera, which costs 250 pounds more or less. Um, you know, it's a really nice camera, produces very nice images. Um, again, a better camera would be the GX Cam U3. Pro 6.3, 6.3 megapixel camera sensor. This is a back illuminated sensor, so it's more sensitive, has better dynamic range, and that's about 700 pounds. And then again, we have one nearly sort of about 1800 pounds, an eight megapixel camera, which is produces glorious images. Again, it's a very high end Sony sensor, um, and it produces you know excellent quality images. And again, as I said, like with like with, with the microscopes, you know, with the technology, if you pay a bit more, you get a better quality sensor, you get better quality images with it, sort of thing. So it's a range from sort of, you know, I guess sort of 250 pounds up to maybe nearly a couple of thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that, that's all, helpful. And then yeah, the, 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 the actual... Just one, thing, just one thing, Alan. So yeah, I mean, just yeah. one point. With all of these, please ask us for advice. Oh, if, yeah. people, if people want any information about it, you know, um, come to a website, have a look there, click on the you know need help button or email us. You know, we're more than happy to say, you know, customers email us to say, look, I'm looking for something to do with this, my budget is this, what can you advise? Yeah, we're happy to help. The, the, I, I absolutely second that. That you, you, your company's always been very helpful, but I, I you know I have to say actually all, all the microscopy companies uh, I've ever talked to, the best advice I could give anyone would be pick up the phone and call them and talk to mm -hmm. them. And obviously, if you find a microscopy company who doesn't want to talk to you, then go somewhere else. <laughs> it's, yeah, the, and then, the, the, can, can we just finish off the the, the filthy the filthy financial side of it? Um, the, the digital uh, uh, microscope with the display screens, what, what sort of price range are we talking for those? Um, depends a little bit on the technology. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose you're sort of starting... Mm, maybe 800 pounds ish going up to maybe a couple of thousand pounds mm -hmm. okay um, again it depends a little bit on the size of the camera sensor you have you know what outputs you want some of them have a built-in pc um so again again you know there's a large range of them depending what people's requirements are um and again you know we're happy to advise people say let's come you know let's have a chat about it sort of thing so yeah, yeah. That, that's that's really helpful. Thanks. I know if we hadn't had that discussion, you, there'd be loads of people saying, "Yeah, but how much does it cost?" You know, we have yeah. to we have to sort of cover that so that people yeah. have some idea. So thanks very much for that. No and just to mention, so the the other one is the Dino Light, which is a little yeah. handheld sort of pen type thing. So start about eighty pounds, go up to about hundred pound, pick up to about eight hundred pounds. I said there's a huge range there. I mean, there's some really nice ones for sort of a couple of hundred pounds. 
So he, do, again, do, you know. do people use those much for, um, you know, sort of entomology where you've got larger, very sort of three dimensional specimens? Yes, I mean, again, it does have this extended depth of field feature within the, within the software with many of them. Um, and, you know, it's just a really convenient thing to use. I mean, they're just very, very handy. I think probably people use them as well as a stereo microscope. Um, you know, so if they can take it into the field, do some sort of quick, yeah. you know, check on things there before bringing it back to do their look on this sort of proper microscope. Yeah. Um, but they are very, very good quality anyway. You can get some very, very, very good, you know, very excellent images with them anyway. So, you know, they're, they're very handy from that point of view. Yeah, I'm going to just uh, chip in there as much for the recording as anything else. When I first started doing a lot of uh, dissections of moths, I actually started off with a cheap USB camera. I'm afraid it wasn't a dino light and eventually I gave it away. But my point was, is that uh, set up on the stand I had, it was good enough and fast enough to enable me to do an entry level dissection. But this was typically of back room moths and their, their bits were a bit bigger. And then I had a, a compound microscope. So I'd use that to make a slide up, a semi-permanent slide. And then I would take some photographs through that microscope using a um, adapter for my phone. And it's worth just saying, I mean, you, you can actually start off on macro moths like that, but when you're trying to dissect things that are a lot smaller, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're so teeny tiny mm. but the point is you know i think if i'd had a better microscope uh of that usb microscope with a better stand mm. i would probably have gone um, a little bit further than i did and it, it did make a very useful entry level um tool but then i progressed to a stereo microscope Mm -hmm. um, it was one of yours um, and, and then I upgraded again um, uh, uh, after that when, when I got a bit more uh, experience. But I think something you, you've touched on several times but maybe not described in full detail is the range of stands for the microscope. So I've actually mm -hmm. got two stands for one of my microscopes. I have three tripods for one camera. Mm -hmm. you know, and they all do different things and they're all really useful. But I think it might be worth, if you can, just tell us a bit more about what the, the choice of different stands for, for microscopes and what they're, they're good for, because mm. I didn't know there was so much choice yeah. until I started asking questions. Okay. Um, I, mean, I think probably the most popular stand is what we call a dual LED track stand. Mm -hmm. So that basically you mount the microscope head, the stereo microscope head um, onto the stand. And then it has a base with a, a light brought into it and also a top light as well. So it'll shine light through the sample for transparent samples. It also has a light pointing down at the sample for reflected light. And so it just gives you a lot of flexibility to the type of samples you can look at. Um, so it's a track stand so you can focus up and down to uh, get the image in focus for you. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, they probably the most popular ones that we do. Um, we have another type, which again has a transmitted light base. This time it has two gooseneck um, illuminators. And so you can actually position those a little easier. So it can give you a chance to sort of actually manipulate the goosenecks around, to actually shine, shine onto the sample in the right place for you. And again, you know, that could be handy for entomologists where you might want to actually get the light sort of positioned exactly right where you want it to. Um, we have basically those type of stands, but without any illumination. If you wanted to add on your own ring light or your own spotlights, you can have this. Um, we have a stand with a mirror base. So with this one, the light actually is, is reflected in a, at an angle onto the base, and then it hits the mirror to shine it up onto the sample. And these type of things are very good for, um, well, like the, the, the colleague is going to talk about next week, aquatic invertebrates, which aren't really very highly colored often. You need to have a bit more contrast in the illumination. Mm -hmm. So a mirror base is really handy with those. Um, so the other types of things like boom arm stands where, you know, you have a big stand, you have a boom coming out of it, the, the head fits on top of that. And that's good for sort of larger samples where you can actually position the, the microscope head properly. Let's mm -hmm. say you've got an articulated arm stand where you can actually move the camera around and orientate it properly. Um, again, it's really handy if you've got a larger sample, you want to sort of make sure you've, you've got the microscope head pointing in a particular direction for you. Um, 
So again, they're probably the main types of ones. I said they are sort of variants of all of them in terms of, you know, do you want a large base, a small base? Do you want a pole stand or a track stand and things like this? But I said they're probably the main types of ones which we would routinely supply. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, I, I think that's re really helpful that you've sort of expanded on, on, on that. Because I know if you're talking to somebody specifically, they describe to you what they're trying to do mm. and you, you throw out the answers. Um, and uh, you, you did that with, with me, actually. And I've ended up, my second stand is actually one of the, the boom stands, which are used with the Zoom 3. But interestingly, I now use it with the 0.5 reduction le uh, lens. And you mm. you talked about supplementary lenses. So instead of increasing the power, I've reduced the power. And the, what this lets me do is that when I'm actually setting MOS, particularly micro MOS, I want three to four times magnification. I need plenty of space to work. I'm waggling my hands around on the, the desk. Mm. So I've got a setting board, I've got the boom microscope, and I can work and do the, uh, the, the, the setting there. But what, I, what I've also found is that is a superb setup to do dissections. So mm. when I'm doing micro MOS, if you're you've got a stand and it's elevated perhaps 30 millimeter, 35 millimeter. Very difficult to get your hands in the right place. Whereas if you've got a lovely flat surface and plenty of room, it's much easier to do. And to get that, I need the re re reduced magnification. Mm. But, but, I, uh, um, but where I suspect where people only occasionally need high, very high magnification, Maybe the uh, supplementary lenses that magnify may also be useful and again. So I, I don't know what the choices are. I, we had a discussion, the reduction in power suited me. It meant I could get rid of a desk magnifier that used to sit on mm -hmm. it and also some supplementary glasses that uh, went on with magnifiers. So mm -hmm. it's space off my desk. But, but what can you do with the uh, object, you know, supplementary objectives as well, Bill? <laughs> Well, I think, Paul, you, you actually described it very well yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well, well we, we had about 10 or 15 emails on the top topic. Yeah. One, um, I went away and thought and asked you another question. Yeah, no, I think it's a fair point, though. I mean, basically, as you say, I mean, most stereo microscopes have a working range of about 100 millimetres. So, mm. you know, you have a reasonable working distance underneath the microscope head. Um, and that's with like a what we would say a, a one times magnification. As you, as you said, so if you could put a half times um, objective onto the bottom of the microscope, um, what that will do, it'll halve the magnification, but basically double the working distance, more or less, talking you know, in round figures sort of thing. So instead of your 100 millimetres working distance, you've got 200 millimetres working distance. That gives you much more room to actually you know, get your hands, tools, and bits and pieces underneath without it hitting the microscope head. Hmm. Um, is, there, is there any possibility of uh, triggering an electronic flash from one of these microscope cameras? Mm. Not from one of these. I'm thinking particularly about the, uh, the fact that you can get an extremely short flash duration and freeze motion and things like that. Yeah, um, not with these ones, no. Um, I mean, with some very high-end microscope cameras, um, you can have things like a TTL input or output, um, which enable you to then sort of synchronize with other things like a, like a flash type of thing. Mm -hmm. But with these ones, no, I mean, they're just purely USB to the PC. Unless, yeah. there, I don't know, unless there's some clever way you could use some sort of, you know, USB synchronization or write your own script and stuff like this. But I mean, I'm not aware of any way of doing that. Um, I mean, you know, I said, I mean, some very high end cameras, when you're talking, you know, many, many thousands of pounds, sure. you have to have this triggering feature um, via TTL. But I mean, you know, it's for this type of thing. So we want to sort of synchronize it with something. But I mean, it's not. A microscope camera which we would supply though you need to have a you know very spe very specialist thing, thing for that yeah i guess for that you'd really want to uh, set up your dslr as the photography mechanism and use it it's electronic flash possibilities mm -hmm. yeah. i, th I think i think you could i think you could do that relatively easy with with um electronic flash guns uh, mm. such as they are now um you know if you if you just use the camera con to control the exposure if you're using a dslr or a mirrorless camera and then you can you can just trigger the flashes remotely 
Um, but I, I, I've thought about this as, as well, John. I've thought about, you know, it's, it's really attractive, the idea of having a 10,000th of a second exposure yeah. to reduce yeah. vibrations, but I've never actually come across anybody that does it in practice. Oh. So I'm guessing there's a problem somewhere along the line. So it, it remains <laughs> a theory anyway. <laughs> I, think, I, I think the quantity of light you might be able to, if you work out how a, you know, a, a standard flash gun looks, it's kind of designed to spread light out. Um, I think directing that light onto the specimen in a controllable and appropriate way uh, to give a good quality image might be quite difficult um because because the the idea of having a really short exposure time is is something i've thought about a lot but i've never actually found anyone who does it which kind of suggests to me that there's a probably a reason for that i think there's a hiccup there so yeah there's got to be some problem <laughs> uh, uh, yeah i'm gonna ch chip in there because i did think of doing exactly what you're you're suggesting uh john and i ended up buying one of the uh, the ring lights which, have not, which I, I now use. Um, but if you don't mind messing around with the soldering um, iron, I, I bought one of the Wii Macro servos, which I use with, with one of the um, uh, stands. And so that, that um, comes with some software to drive, it drives the servo, which drives the fine focus on the microscope. And the problem with it, is that there's no direct way of interfacing with the GT Vision software. So I did open heart surgery on a, a little USB mouse, soldered an extra pair of uh, connections across and used the zero volt relay to actually make a left click of the mouse. So all I do is I, when I'm ready to do a servo run, I was doing it today actually, I just position the mouse above the quick save and off, off you go. But because you can control the delay, uh, various delays that you, you've got there, you could use that same signal to set off the, um, the, the, the flash gun, if that's what you uh, were trying. Yeah. And the, the other thing is that when you dive into it a bit, there's, there's people out there who will sell you a general purpose USB board uh, with, and if you don't mind doing a little bit of coding, you, you, you can actually code the interactions you, you, yourself. So you could fire, say, two relays in, in sequence or something. So, yeah. yes, you could do it. Yes, I've got the skill to do it. But I actually found that the ring light did everything that I wanted to. And I think the main thing I would say is have a really good sturdy desk. This is a very, very sturdy desk I work on. And I don't let anybody walk around in the study while I'm doing a, a photo run. It's stay, stay by the door <laughs> and, and you know, reduce vibration. And uh, as Alan says, that, that seems to be uh, good enough. But if you do make it work, I would be fascinated to see your uh, results. But if, I, if you I, can... on macro photography with my camera, I do use mm -hmm very short uh, flashes, but not on the microscope. If, if you can make it work, John, you're going to be a speaker at a future microscope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd be fascinating. So there's a hazard associated then yeah. with doing this. <laughs> Don't tell us if you get it to work, because, you know. <laughs> the, um, can, I, can I just go back to the, um, so, so um, I, I think Paul said this, illumination is absolutely key to, mm. Uh, particularly the sort of, I mean, if you've got a very transparent specimen on a compound microscope, nine times out of 10, you're going to be using transmitted light. It's relatively straightforward. I mean, I know there are things you can do like, you know, face contrast or, or, or dark field, um, but, but it's relatively simple. When you start coming to these uh, opaque uh, three-dimensional things like insects, it gets a, it gets a bit trickier. Um, and I have to say the dome light uh, that you that you talked about, Philip, was it, I mean, I have seen I've seen them and they are fantastic. Uh, there is one problem uh, that, as you said, the typical working distance for the, the stereo microscopes around 100 mil uh, and the dome lights about 100 mil deep. 
And mm. the problem then is once you fit the dome light, you just can't manipulate the specimen. You just can't do anything with it. No, um, exactly. As I said, it is more sort of for, for photography where, you know, you want to, mm. you know, really nice, even illumination to capture, you know, that, that really nice image of your sample. But you said you can't work underneath it. No, I mean, it's just, it, it just, you know, takes up all the working distance of the, of the stereo. But, you know, it is a really nice thing for, you know, for, you know, doing just general sort of looking at stuff and then to capture they, images of it. So, they, yeah. they, they do, they do work really well. I, mm. I know someone who uses one and they are superb. I have to say for 500 quid, uh, I, I did buy a plastic, white plastic pudding basin off eBay <laughs> and, and stick my ring light facing upwards rather than downwards. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but um, it, it's probably not as good, but, you know, it's a lot of money. Uh, no, it's, it is frustrating. They are expensive. And you said, I mean, you know, your ring light in the white pudding basin does exactly the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it shines the light up into, into a white dome to, to reflect it mm -hmm. back down again and work that way. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it, good, well, you know, nice idea. I might go into business. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's also worth um, mentioning again, you, you did touch on this in the uh, talk that lots of microscopes come with only um, uh, uh, transmitted um, uh, illumination, illumination below the stage. Yeah. Uh, illumination above the stage is pretty common with stereo microscopes because well, you, you can fit your ring lights, yeah. much less common with various sorts of compound microscopes. I know you're going to chip in and say, but ah, yes, you know, you, you do do sell them with um, uh, top lighting. Yeah, I've, I've got one um, here and the top lighting works. But as we found out at a, a talk um, for the Microscope Club uh, a few weeks ago, looking at mites, mites are completely opaque and you really do need top lighting in order to be able to see them. So if anybody's sort of, um, thinking about what you know, sort of microscope they want. If you're looking at opaque specimens, it is really worth making sure that, that a person you're talking to knows about this and so mm -hmm. can advise on um, using um, top lighting. And one of the things I found, I'm just going to reach my magic widget over here, right, is that uh, I, I bought some of um, these. These are samples of uh, LED diffusers and when I'm just using top lighting I actually put the microscope slide on top of this so the top lighting uh, illuminates the specimen and makes a lovely diffuse light behind the specimen as well which makes for a much better photograph it, it all comes down to with your own setup your own specimens you, you've got to figure out what lighting works but it it comes down to lighting, lighting, lighting. But this background diffuser underneath the top light, I found works really, really well um, for, for me. And some of the other stands, uh, you can have uh, stereo microscopes. You can sometimes have both top and backlighting through a diffuser at the same time, which again, can improve the quality of the photograph, whatever you're actually um, doing, doing with it. So yeah, we, we talk about top lighting. So, so John, are you going to go away with the and um, do something with the soldering iron? We've, we've got to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so, like a pretty strong inducement to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I say we'd love it if if you did do something like that. It would be uh, fascinating. It, again, but the main thing is, that, did it actually? Does it actually work? Is it worth mm -hmm. the effort? of um, doing so, or is just keeping very still and taking your time with the photographs, does that mm. do the, the same job without the soldering? Yes. Just a silly thing I think is worth saying for anyone who's, you know, who's is watching this and is going to be new to microscopy, just, just make sure your microscope is, uh, you know, Paul's talked about having a sturdy desk. Make sure it is somewhere that doesn't bounce up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, standing in on a pile of concrete blocks is a uh, is a good option. Uh, suspended wooden floors are a bad option. You know, solid floors are a much better option. The um, the the, the in the uh, British uh, Arachnological Society, there's a uh, very famous uh, mic microscopist who uh, called Jeremy Poole. 
um, who, who bought himself a scanning electron microscope just because he kind of wanted to. You don't actually need an SEM to take photos of spiders, but he does. Uh, <laughs> and he produces some fantastic images. And he got a great deal on the microscope. But boy, building the building to put the microscope <laughs> in cost an absolute <laughs> fortune. It cost many times the cost of the microscope. Yeah. But you know, this is this 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 a lot of people ignore this stuff. They they ignore what they're actually placing their microscope on. They don't mm. think enough about the yeah. lighting. They get obsessed with the optics of the microscope, but that's only one component of forming mm. an image. Mm. Yeah. There is one thing I can add there, Alan, is that we do supply anti-vibration tables and anti-vibration yeah, stands. Yeah, right. So it's just something that just fits under the microscope, helps isolate it from the bench and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, again, huge range of options for it, um, but it just you know, means you can actually then put it on pretty much any sort of bench you want to, and then the microscope is, isn't affected by any vibration and so on. So yeah, again, yeah, the, the, there's these things available if people are interested in them. Yeah, is that, I mean, so I live on a, my, my study uh, opens onto a bus route. And fortunately, I know the bus timetable, so I don't try and do focus stacking yeah. when a bus is due. But <laughs> maybe I should invest in an anti-vibration table. Maybe that would work. Yeah. 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 Well, again, you know, things are there to help people out. So, you know, if you want to, to isolate it from your bench, then these things will work mm -hmm. for you, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the point I was just trying to get across was people get obsessed with, mm. you know, just, just like people get obsessed with megapixels on cameras, people mm. get obsessed with microscope optics, and obviously they're important, but, you know, there are other things that are important too, like lack of vibration, lack of air movement, uh, lighting, you know, there's a lot of components involved in forming an image. Mm. I think, like Paul was saying earlier, I mean, you know, the illumination is the key part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you don't get that right, you won't get a very nice image. So, you know, you spend a little bit more time, you know, thinking about, you know, do I need a ring light? Do I need some spotlights? Do I need a dome light? You know, then if I've got the goose next, how do I orientate them against my, my image and things like this? So, you know, spending time getting the illumination right will make the whole whole process much more enjoyable and give you much better results certainly the, yeah. the nice thing about gooseneck lamps is they allow you to control the contrast mm -hmm. uh with a with a ring light you know it's essentially on or off i mean i know you can adjust the intensity but it's pretty much on or off with with a ring light by a, with the goosenecks by adjusting the angle of the gooseneck particularly in entomology you can reveal things like hairs and mm. three-dimensional structure by changing the angle of the light mm. uh, and, and i often use a ring light and goosenecks together mm. um, because you know you get you get your your sort of basic illumination from the ring light and then you play around with the goosenecks until you can actually see that that tiny hair on the hind leg that you mm. need to to identify a particular species, you know, so that it, it, you, using more than mixing different types of illumination can be quite handy as well. Yeah. yeah. And this point, um, again, I know it's a kind of heading towards the wrap up, but what you, you just mentioned it about the um, uh, megapixels, you don't need to be obsessed with the number of uh, megapixels. When you're you know, using a DSLR, you're, you really want the option to crop down the picture an awful lot. So you need, if you like, a lot of megapixels to throw away mm. because you're not going to use them. My wife and I used to play a game where we take a landscape photograph and we crop different images out of the same photograph because you had so many megapixels, you could throw them away. Mm. But when you're you, you, when you're you taking microscopy photographs, you're usually pretty much framing what you want, which was where that very interesting little bit of um, Nikon software is really what you were mm. showing. Because so you're framing at the time you take the photograph, yeah. so you don't need all those megapixels to to throw away to crop um, later. Mm. And uh, I, I've been thinking, I was thinking about it when you explained it. I thought, yes, that's kind of been niggling me um, a little bit for, for quite, a, quite a long time because mm. I don't understand, or what didn't quite understand why some comparatively small photographs, inverted commas, look so flipping good. Mm. And, and it's basically because they were good, high quality, well balanced um, uh, I I images. And of course, once you've got a really good image or a couple of really good images, you can then do all sorts of post-processing mm. with them as well. But that's but, not but really I think this talk. I, 
I, I think the comments also about pixel size and dynamic range are, mm -hmm. um, you know, significant, probably, uh, particularly, I think the dynamic range probably more significant than the number of megapixels for microscopy. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree. In fact, um, uh, you know, kind of again, fitting in with this, when I'm setting up to take photographs, the thing that I always check is am I starting off with a reasonable looking histogram because um, it, it can be really hard by eye to judge whether you're flooding it or it's too dark. But if you've, you, you've got a, quite a nice spread histogram as you're taking the pictures, then you can do, you know, this, you've got so much information there, it's gonna stack really well if that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's enough information there for you to use post-processing techniques to bring out Mm -hmm. more detail because I mean if you're, you're sending it up to say the moth dissection website then you do need to do a lot of post-processing to to kind of finish the photograph um, off to get it ready to, to to post there so I would say the uh, the histogram is function is, is a really really useful thing to gauge how how good the photograph uh, are you getting the best out of the sensor and lens combination? Mm. So one, one, one final comment from me, uh, you know, as, as Paul said, we're heading towards a wrap up. We'll, we'll, we'll see if anybody else has got any more questions. But one thing uh, or, or in this area is uh, I would put a word out for mirrorless cameras um, and which, which I use for, for two main reasons. Um, first is no nasty flappy mirror, because that nasty flappy vibratory mirror is bad news for microscopy. Uh, but the other major thing is um, something called focus peaking that you can get on um, uh, um, uh, um, a, a, a mirrorless camera. Um, and um, it's where the software and the camera um, highlights which area of the um, uh, um, specimen or the image are in focus based on the contrast ratios and so when I'm doing a focus stack I generally use the focus peaking to track across the image and choose my image sets I don't have a servo like Paul does um, so uh, that, that's another big plus for mirrorless cameras um, that that really helps yeah. and by the way you don't actually need a servo it, it's I'm techie, I love playing around with this stuff and it's really nice doing it, but you can take superb photos by hand. And on my digital microscope, I only ever take the stack um, by, by hand. Um, yes, I, I, I could figure out a way to do it, but I think the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that I haven't got enough of an incentive to do so because the photos are so good I, I, I just, just don't need to, but with some uh, lower magnification um, stacks of moths, you end up doing perhaps a 70 stack. And it's really nice being able to just set that off, nip out, make a cup of tea, come back, and the stack is ready to um, pro process. But for microscope slides, it's, it's, not, worth, it's not worth the hassle. <laughs> So do we um, do we have any more questions? Well, we've got Philip here with us this evening. Is there anyone anything else, anyone else wanted to ask? Maybe I can ask you, Philip. What what do you think for in this area that we are talking in in the biological area? Because obviously, I know your company sells microscopes uh, for all different purposes. But in the biological area, what, what what would you say was the most frequently asked question that that people ask you? Apart from what sort of microscope should I buy? <laughs> uh, I, that's a really tricky one to answer. You, I mean, this, I mean, the interesting thing from my point of view about the job that I do is everyone's requirements are different. Right. So, yeah. you know, I mean, at the moment we're talking to some entomologists. I mean, you know, tomorrow I could be talking to someone doing sort of, you know, tissue sections, mm -hmm. tissue culture, you know, minerals and everything like this. They're all very different. And... Uh, it's really difficult to answer that question just because the, the, the diverse, you know, range of applications people have and, you know, the diverse things people want to do with microscopes. So, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I can really answer that in any sort of meaningful way. 
that that's a reasonable answer because that brings us back to what we said earlier really if you're thinking about buying a microscope pick up the phone and and make a call and have a discussion rather than just picking one off the website and saying well you know i'll do that one uh it it is it is i guess the way to go yeah absolutely i think so i mean you know the thing is i mean you know i mean gt vision you know we all like microscopes we've been you know involved with microscopes for many many years and you know we can advise so if people say look you know i'm looking for something to do with this we say ah well you know from that point of view that might be a good thing to consider or there's another option over here but don't look at that one because that might not be so suitable for you so yeah as you say you know i mean we're happy to help out we're happy to you know have a chat with people and make sure they're happy with the microsoft that they, that they end up buying certainly Okay, well, thanks very much, Philip. Um, I think uh, what we'll do is we'll wind the uh, recording uh, up for now and, and, and thank you. Um, I, I know a lot of people are going to watch this over the years on YouTube and, and, and I hope it, <laughs> it is really useful to them. Yeah, so, right, hopefully. Sorry if I freaked you out with that, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to your group. That's been useful. <laughs>